Okay, everybody, uh, we're ready to get started. Uh, so today, uh, or the next presentation here is going to be uh, covering the automation toolkit. And I have with me uh, David Larson, and David is a uh, senior software engineer at Algorithmic. So take it away, David. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, thanks all for, for coming here. It's, it's great seeing we have such a big crowd here today. Uh, so I'm going to talk about automation and I'm going to do it in the context of uh, texturing and substance. And uh, before I start, I wanna talk, also mention that I will show a lot of specific demos today, but this presentation is not about the specific thing I'm doing. I kinda want to get the gear spinning in your head and you start thinking about automation and texturing. Uh, because from what I've seen here, I think there is a lot of opportunity, but when I visit studios, I don't see it's being used to the extent that it should be, and I think there is a lot of things that we, can be done in this space. So why do we want to uh, automate stuff? And uh, it comes with a lot of benefits and, and opportunities. Um, whoops. Oh, that's the right slide. Um, so the first thing is having everything up to date. So whenever someone change a 3D model, they change a substance material, you wanna make sure that all your SPSAR files are up to date. So if there is a dependency between different substance graphs, you use something as a utility node, you wanna make sure that all the SPSARs uh, that somehow uses this utility node are all up to date. And uh, it can also be used for, if you're rendering out textures from uh, your projects or images that you're using in your game engine, when you update the substance file, you wanna make sure that all the textures are, uh, are updated properly. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is texturing at scale. Uh, so when it comes to um, uh, certain types of assets, uh, typically environment assets, uh, props, those kind of things are often uh, very uh, simple in the structure and it's kind of, um, I wouldn't use the wa uh, term wasted time, but it's like not perhaps the best uh, spent time by texturing artists, uh, loading up the, all these models and, and generating textures for them. And very often you can get very good results with scripts. And by doing that, you can have your artists spend time on the, on the hero assets instead. And, um, and very often you can build very simple tools uh, that allows you to texture certain types of assets in a consistent and uh, very uh, fast way. Oh, look at that. So now there is uh, FBX support in, uh, in PowerPoint, by the way. Uh, uh, so another thing with, uh, with automation and, um, and also proceduralism. So, uh, at Substance, at Algorithmic, uh, proceduralism is a very important thing. And together with automation, it allows you to test out a lot of uh, variations. You can iterate on stuff, you can experiment with stuff. And rather than having artists like load all their stuff and change parameters and export textures, uh, if you set up things in an automated way, you can make kind of large scale changes. You wanna change what the moss looks like on every rock in a game, or you wanna change something about uh, whether, how much snow you have on your assets, those kind of things. Uh, with proceduralism and automation, you can quickly try out uh, large scale changes to your assets um, and see what it does for the game and uh, get the right results. If you don't have this, you very often don't try as much as you would do because it means that you would have to have artists spend time uh, testing out all of this manually. And uh, what it all, all comes down to is essentially saving time. Uh, and it's not only about like, you know, generating all these massive, uh, massive amount of assets, it can also be about not locking up someone's workstation when they're exporting textures. Uh, you don't wanna have your artist sitting there and looking at progress bar when it's something that can be taken care of by a script that runs every time you check an asset into Perforce. And um, there are a lot of things too that if you look at something like Substance Designer, it's a very versatile application. If you have workflows where, some, where you need to wrangle texture channels, you wanna put the, uh, put the height map in the alpha channel of the normal map, those kind of things. Uh, you, can, you can set up scripts and uh, use our batch processors to do that for you automatically. And, and again, like it's, uh, 
it, if you don't have your artist doing these mundane tasks, they can spend much more time actually painting on the assets where the most, uh, that matters the most. So obviously there are limits of automation and like robots and humans are uh, good at different things. Uh, so a computer is very good at dealing with things at scale. If you have massive amount of assets that need to be rebuilt, it's great to have a computer do it for you. They're also very good at like being, uh, paying attention to details. If you want consistently named and things being perfectly up to date, it's very good to let a computer do it. Uh, and finally, they are happy to work overnight, right? You, you can uh, have all of these things running in the background, running overnight, nightly builds, rather than, um, uh, whereas humans, they, they obviously need time to rest. And, um, and, um, but on the other hand, for hero assets, and when it comes to common sense and actually like knowing what things should look like, we, we need humans. And uh, so it's better to make sure that we play to each other's strengths and uh, let the computers do the boring stuff and let the human do the creative work. So um, when it comes to automating things in the substance world, uh, we have the substance automation toolkit. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what the features are uh, in it. Then I'm going to talk about some example pipelines I've built for using the automation toolkit to solve some common tasks in the, uh, in the substance world. And uh, finally, after that, I will uh, uh, do questions and answers. So what is the Substance Automation Toolkit? So it, it contains two uh, main parts, but the, the important thing here is that it's mainly dealing with low-level tasks. So it's not going to provide you a bunch of UIs and applications and things. It's uh, providing the low-level tasks so that you can build your own pipeline, your own uh, applications that you use to automate various things. Uh, so the first component are our batch tools. Uh, so these batch tools, they mimic a lot of the functionality inside of Substance Designer and Substance Painter. And um, uh, the automation toolkit is way more in the Substance Designer side of things because it's more of a procedural and large scale application, whereas Painter is more working on an individual asset. Uh, so with the batch tools, uh, there is SBS Baker that basically does all the baking uh, operations you can do in Designer, but you can do it from a command line instead. Uh, we have the SPS cooker that cooks SPS file to SPS AR files. And then there is SPS renders that uh, renders out maps from your SPS AR files. Uh, we also have SPS mutator for making minor changes to SPS files. And uh, finally, SPS updater that you can use to, to bring your old substance files up to the latest version uh, using a command line tool. So in addition to that, there is also a Python API for in the automation toolkit. And this Python API allows you to pretty much do anything you can do from Substance Designer, but using Python scripts. So it allows you to edit and create Substance files on the fly. And um, so you can use it to compose things out of uh, Substance you have pre-authored, but you can also completely create new ones. And for certain tasks, such as if you're doing iteration or like if you're doing uh, uh, filters where you need to sample a lot of textures, uh, it, it can be much more convenient to write them using our Python API. Uh, it also allows you to reflect uh, your uh, substance files. So basically you can know exactly what parameters they, are, uh, they have, uh, what the ranges are for all the parameters, and all the substance files that uh, a certain file depends on. So if you're reusing or like importing a bunch of substance files inside another one, uh, for certain operations, it's really important to be able to figure out exactly uh, what it depends on. And I'll show some demos around that. It also contains uh, batch tools uh, or Python functions to call our batch tools. So rather than manually generating command lines, you can use our Python calls to, uh, to invoke them. And um, finally, it's a completely standalone substance uh, Python library which basically allows you to load it in any Python environment you can imagine. So it loads cleanly in Maya and Blender and Houdini, and um, it's not going to cause any problems. Okay, so uh, when you wanna automate things, you need to think in terms of a pipeline. So what is a pipeline? So according to Wikipedia, uh, in computing a pipeline is a set of data processing element connected in a series where the output of one element 
is the input of the next one. And um, what you need to do to automate things is basically look at whatever texturing process you're going to do and try to turn it into something that uh, looks like a pipeline. So by breaking it down that way, it allows you to, to automate it or aut automate certain stages of it. Um, and what we want from a pipeline here is we want something that is incremental. So if you have a library of a thousand SPS files and someone changes one of them, uh, you change a color of a material uh, and you say, okay, let's compile all of them. And so we have uh, SPS AR files for them. You don't really want to rebuild all thousand of them. You just want to rebuild the one you changed. And um, uh, if you just write like the naive Python script to re reprocess things, it's very likely that you will do way too much when you make a small change. Uh, on the other hand, we also want to make sure everything is correct. We want to make sure everything is up to date and everything is built and you don't miss out on uh, important changes to your data and uh, have like inconsistent results in your tools uh, compared to your game. Uh, we also want the pipeline to make sure that it uses as much of its available compute resources as possible. So we want it to be performant. Uh, very often you have uh, multi-core machines. You might even have multiple machines available at your disposal that uh, can work for you. And we want to make sure that whatever we build uses as much of that as possible. And finally, we want it to be flexible. We want to be able to bring in tools that are not necessarily substance tools in the texturing process. Certain things we don't provide solutions for. If you need a new UV set for a model, today your solution is open something like Maya or Max but it can be very important in an automation process that if you get like a mesh that is scanned and has no UV set, you need to be able to generate one. So we can't have a solution that is completely tied to the substance world. Uh, so for people that are familiar with these type of processes, this all sounds like a build system. Uh, so what is a build system? Uh, it's basically a directed graph of operations. That might sound fancy. I'll show a slide of uh, what it actually means. But typically, it uh, allows you to express the pipeline I was talking about before. Uh, it typically implements the different build operations as command line tools, uh, which is, uh, <clears throat> fits very well with what we are providing. It stores its intermediate results as files. Uh, that also fits well with the ability to, uh, to do incremental updates. If you're reprocessing a lot of things and almost everything is the same, the intermediate files are there uh, rather than having to be rebuilt all the time. They tend also to be very good at knowing what depends on what. So if you do a change to one file, anything that downstream that depends on that file will also need to be updated and this system can keep it track for you. And finally, it can exploit this uh, directed graph in order to find parallelism for computing. Uh, so here is an example of a, a build process. And uh, here we have um, a substance file that is called mossy rock. And it depends on a moss substance and a rock substance. Uh, we also have a uh, low polygon rock and a high polygon rock going into this process. And what we want to do is we basically want to texture uh, this uh, rock with, a, with this mossy uh, substance. And uh, these blue boxes here, they represent the inputs. So the first thing we want to do is we want to cook the SPS file to an SPS AR file. Uh, we also want to bake maps where we use the low polygon mesh as the, with the UV as the uh, low poly mesh, and then we have the high polygon mesh that provides the details. So we use SPS Baker to create a bunch of intermediate files here that we then send into SPS Render in order to render out the actual maps. Uh, so if we look at this from a process point of view, you can see that we can think of it as three different processes here. One cooking, one baking, and one rendering process. And the first thing to notice is that uh, the cooker and the baker process are completely independent. There are no inputs here that affects, uh, none of these inputs here in the cooking process affect the baking process, which basically means that if we make an update to the, uh, to the geometry, uh, we don't have to, uh, recook the SPS file in order to render it. And in the same way, if we change one of these materials, we can use the bakes from the last time we ran it, right? And um, then you have the 
the third process that depends on both of them. So when there is a change on either side, we always need to rerun process three. Um, and these boxes also represent how this system can uh, find parallelism in this. So if you uh, have a workstation with multiple cores, process one and process two can run uh, at the same time on different GPUs because they, there are no dependencies between them. And uh, also when it comes to parallelism, imagine that you have 50 rocks or you know, multiple materials you wanna apply to them, they can also be run in parallel and the build system can do that for you. Uh, so in my examples, I'm going to use a build system called SCONS. Uh, it's a Python-based build system, which fits, fits very well with the fact that the automation toolkit is based on Python. Um, it also has a pretty sophisticated dependency control uh, that I'm not going to dig too deep into. But uh, the most important part of this slide is that this is a sample. I'm not like endorsing and saying this is the best solution for this. And at uh, major game studios, there are already a lot of builds processes uh, available. And if you get inspired by, by what I'm showing here, you're probably in a better position to try to integrate some texturing automation in the current build processes rather than trying to, to use, uh, create a new one. Okay, so let's do some demos. So the first one here is about substance source. Uh, so what I have is a set of substance files uh, from the substance source library. And in my case, it's the SPS files. And what I want to do is I want to run a process where I uh, make sure I always have an up-to-date SPS AR file. And I also want to integrate a, uh, a thumbnail in the SPS AR. So the process would look like this. You load the SPS file, you cook it to an uh, SPS AR, you use that SPSAR to render out a, PBR, a set of PBR maps. Uh, you're going to ren uh, you render a thumbnail swatch. You inject that thumbnail into the S original SPS file. You cook it again, and then you store out the SPSAR. That's the output of the process. I'm also going to store out the, an uh, image uh, showing the uh, thumbnail that was rendered in a directory. So we get kind of a, a set of PNG files that if you have, for instance, a web-based material selector, it would be great to be able to just show that on a web page so an artist can select based on an image rather than a name. Okay, so uh, let's look at what we have here. So the data directory here is where I have my mini version of substance source. So I've decided only to have uh, the ceramic, the fabric, and the metal materials. And you can see there are a ton of different materials in here, and uh, these materials are SPS files. Some of them have their own dependencies here, so this one has a little pattern it depends on. Uh, also, there is a directory of common dependencies here, and these common dependencies uh, are used by all the different materials in there in various ways. And uh, as I was talking about before, when it comes to correctly making sure everything is up to date, uh, if someone changes something in here, we don't really know which ones of the substances actually uses this, uh, this uh, library substance that's here in the common dependencies. And uh, in order to get that right, we, we need to tell the build system to uh, to, to scan what, what the dependencies are in order to do things correctly. So I'm going to show you a little bit of Python code here and I'm not going to dig deep into it, uh, but uh, where we have our uh, scons process here. Uh, so the scons script here is basically a Python file and uh, it's, it, co it contains a bunch of builders so we need to be able to cook an SPS file and in this case, we're going to use the batch tools features from the Substance uh, Automation Toolkit in order to invoke the cooker. Uh, we have a process for rendering out PBR maps. Uh, we have a process for using uh, the Arnold renderer to render a thumbnail for us. And we also have a process for injecting a thumbnail uh, into an SPS file here. So you can see this is basically loading our Substance file and it's uh, setting its icon and it's saving it out as a new substance. Finally, we have a scanner here, and the scanner here basically 
looks at the substance file and tells the build system exactly what file it depend, files it depends on. So we open the, the document here and then we get the dependency path list, which is basically all the files that uh, it depends on. And uh, when it comes to actually processing this, uh, what happens here, we go through all the files in our directory and uh, if it's called an, if it's an SPS file, it will call the process SPS file here. Uh, then it checks that the directory it's in is not in the ignore list. And what that means is that the uh, common dependencies file here, they're not going to be treated as materials because they're not materials. And uh, down here, uh, we do the actual processing. Uh, we start by cooking the, uh, cooking the substance file. We're rendering out the maps. We're rendering a thumbnail from it. We're copying the thumbnail to a specific directory. We're injecting the thumbnail in the original SPS file and we're also cooking it again and storing it as the output SPSR. So let's, uh, let's run this process here. So I'm giving it the flag J4 here on the command line, which basically says, let's use, uh, whoops, that was the wrong directory. Let me redo that. Uh, so the J4 flag here basically says that, sorry, uh, that it will run uh, four uh, jobs in parallel uh, if it can. So what happened here is that it did actually, it didn't do anything because I didn't change anything from last time I ran it. Uh, so if we go here and check the output directory, we can see we have the same structure as we had in the, when we started from. But in this case, we actually have SPSAR files in it. And these are SPSAR files with the uh, thumbnail renders in that we rendered using Arnold. And um, you can also see that we have the uh, thumbnail directory here that contains all the thumbnails that were rendered. Uh, so let's make a change to an object here to see how it responds to changes. Um, so we're going to go to my favorite material in here. It's in the fabric directory. The climbing rope. So we take the climbing rope and we make a modification to it. So. So now we have our textures here, and uh, in this case, I'm going to change the color of one of the ropes. And uh, one of the pattern colors here, maybe this purple one, we can do a little U shift and, and we save out that change. And now we run it again, and hopefully it will pick up that we have a change file in here. Yeah, so now we can see it's scanning that file, figuring out the dependencies, cooks the SPS, and then it renders, can I actually? Make this a little bit bigger. Okay, let's, uh, so anyway. Uh, you, and now after it has uh, rendered out the maps, now it's using Arnold to render out the thumbnail. There we go, and finally it updates everything here. So if we go in and check the uh, output directory now uh, and look at the updated fabric here, the climbing rope, you can see it now has an orange, uh, orange uh, uh, pattern, uh, an orange color in the pattern. Uh, so I'm going to go back and correct that because I think the original was actually better than my modification to it. And the next thing I want to show is how this dependency scanning can help you making sure that everything uh, is up to date here. Uh, so in this time, I'm going to go in the common dependencies directory and I'm going to pick one node here. This is a carefully selected node, so we don't have to you know, wait the rest of the presentation for a reprocessing here, because some of these can actually be used by a lot of networks. Uh, in this case, the, uh, nope, that was not the one I wanted actually, it was the, English bond is the one I have looked at before. So the English bond is basically a tile generator that, 
uh, that generates a pattern such as this one, which is being used by two other materials. And I'm going to make a change here. Uh, I'm going to move a node. Uh, in this case, uh, since we're tracking only the uh, date of a file, we can't actually tell the difference uh, to whether this change actually has an impact, so it will still need to rebuild things. Uh, but a good build system such as cons, you can actually uh, make sure that you do a comparison by content where the location actually doesn't matter. I haven't bothered to implement that. But now, uh, as, it, as we run it now, you can see it picks up that the bricks enamel combined use that one. And the climbing rope uh, was updated again because it, uh, it's the same as uh, it, since I changed it back and there was another material being uh, run, uh, pro reprocessed here too. And uh, as all of this is happening here now, it's uh, re-rendering all the maps, it's re-rendering thumbnails, and uh, making sure that uh, your SPSAR files are up to date. And the idea here would be that if you combine something like this with Perforce or whatever asset management system you have, you can have a script that every time someone changes a substance file, reprocess it, build new SPSAR files, put them in Perforce, so that when the next person checks out, make sure they actually have up-to-date files to work with uh, when they go into Painter or wherever they're using these SPSAR files. So again, if we go to the output here, we can first uh, verify that the uh, fabric that we changed, the climbing rope, is back to wh where it used to be. Uh, and also, if we look in the uh, uh, output here among the ceramics, I think we had a, uh, make sure I don't do something dumb here, uh, bricks enamel combined. Uh, Oh, no. Uh, oh, there it is. Thank you so much. Uh, this one, if we check the properties of this one, uh, you can see that it was updated a minute ago. So that one was affected by, by the change. So again, this is the first demo I want to show. And it's something a lot of people are asking for. This one I will make available to you soon. I'm not sure whether it goes on Substance Share or as, or as an example in the Automation Toolkit. But I know pe a lot of people have asked for it. So I want to make sure it's available. So the next one I want to show is related to texturing the rocks I was showing in the beginning. And um, what I want to do, I want to take you through the manual process of texturing these rocks. And uh, after that, I want to show you how I have built a system for texturing them automatically instead. So in this case, uh, a colleague of mine gave me a set of uh, scanned rocks. And I wanted to basically generate the different procedural materials for these scanned rocks. And um, uh, let's start from here, where we have our uh, source rocks here. So these are the five rocks I got. So you can see the, these are uh, scanned rocks. Uh, they're about 800,000 triangles each, so they're highly unsuitable to put in a video game. And also, if we check in the UV editor here, you can see there are no UVs on them. We basically just have the geometry. Uh, so we're not in a position to actually texture these rocks in any good way. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is get a low polygon version of these models. And in this case, I found an excellent open source application called Instant Meshes uh, that basically allows you to take uh, models such as these. So I'm going to take uh, one of these rocks and import it. And I'm going to say I want about 3,000 triangles. Then I press the solve button and I press the other solve button here. And it will give us a uh, quad mesh. Uh, so this is what we got here. So now we have something much simpler that we can work with. So we save it out as rock opt. And we're not quite in a position to actually texture it yet. And uh, when I load it in Maya, you will see exactly why. Uh, so rock opt here, when we load it, uh, there are a few issues with it. The first issue is that it's, uh, the normals are all flat, which basically means that normal maps will behave poorly on it. So the first thing we want to do is we want to average it. 
Uh, the second issue with it is that it has no, uh, it has no UVs. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to be lazy and just use Maya to do an automatic UV uh, layout for us. This is not the optimal UV layout, but it's good enough for, for what I'm going to, to show here. Uh, oops, that was the wrong one. So here you can see we have, uh, have our UV layout for, for the model. Uh, and finally, I'm also going to triangulate it because it's going to happen anyway soon, so I might as well do it here. And we're done, and we're exporting the selection here so that we can bring it into Substance Designer and texture it. So this one we're going to call Rock One Opt UV. So the next step uh, for texturing this rock would be to bring it into Substance Designer. And um, uh, what I got from, from Wes, he provided me a uh, network for generating beautiful rock textures. And um, so if we look at this rock material, I'm not going to go into detail in this one, but it's, um, it basically uh, creates uh, textures, and since this is a procedural uh, approach, what we're going to do is we're going to feed it a bunch of maps. So it's a normal map, a position map, a, no a world space normal, and a ambient occlusion. And in the same way as a mask generator in Substance Painter works, uh, we're going to use that in order to drive all the procedurals here to get good looking, uh, good looking textures for it. Also, this one is mainly built on uh, triplanar projected textures, which means that it's kind of independent of the UV set. It will just do something that looks good. If your UVs are good, uh, it, will, uh, it will allocate textures uh, correctly on it and look consistent. So let's bring in the two, the two models. So here we're going to import both the high resolution original model and the one we optimized that and generated UVs for. And we're going to bake some model information. And, uh, in this case, we're going to use the high polygon mesh here as the um, uh, as high definition mesh, and then we're going to bake 1K textures, and uh, we're going to start with an ambient occlusion from mesh. We're going to do a um, normal map from mesh, a position map from mesh, and finally a world space normals. The world space normals. We're going to use the normals from the uh, previous normal map baker here, so we get all the high polygon details into it as well. So also, if you've noticed, this is the new baker in uh, the 2018 release of Substance Designer, and here you can actually see things happening, and you can see the UV layout and all the images coming in here, and it makes it much more pleasant to, to actually work with bakers, that you, can, you get this feedback when you're working. So finally, we, we have our maps here, and uh, we're going to assign them here and take our ambient occlusion map and put it down here. Normal map up here. I've done this a few times now, so I know which one goes in what slot. Uh, or do I? Maybe I should double check that. Uh, let's make sure we get the position right and the world space normals right here. So now we can see we started populating the, the viewport here with some, some more interesting textures, but in order to make to see what we actually got. We're going to bring in the, the actual model that we, we worked on. And we're gonna view the outputs in 3D view. So here's our textured rock here. Uh, and since this is a procedural network, it allows us to texture it in many different ways. So there are some presets here uh, allowing us to get different uh, styles for this rock. And again, like, the point here is, in a game where rocks are not the key component of the experience, uh, reusing the same meshes with different textures is a great way of just you know, getting more value out of the, all the assets you have here. So here we can see the, the different variations of, of this model. Okay, so how do we automate this process? And in order to do that, I have built a custom uh, application. This custom application is something, it's kind of a test bed that I'm using internally. So it, at the moment, there is like no specific plan to actually release this or make it available. But I, wanna, I wanted to show it to you because uh, very often when you hear about the automation toolkit, you see all of these like, you know, the scripting and the Python and everything. And 
it's not the right way for, for everyone to work. And I'm very aware of that. And it's a very important thing I want to say is that you can actually build these type of tools on top of the automation toolkit uh, to, to make it possible to, to work with these things. So here I've expressed the, the workflow that I was showing here. So it starts by loading the high polygon mesh. It uh, sends it into the remesh instant meshes. Uh, it uses, um, so this one uses the same application I showed before, but as a command line tool. Uh, here we're using a UV layout component. This one is actually an uh, open source solution from Microsoft that used to be part of the DirectX SDK. Generates pretty nice UV layout and it reads OBJ files, so it, it, it solved my problem. Uh, then we also have the baking process here, so we send in the, uh, the original mesh and the low poly mesh with the UV, uh, UVs in there, and that's actually a subgraph. So this is very similar to how the Substance Designer works, but we kind of lifted everything up one step uh, where we work from meshes to images as opposed to only working with, uh, with images. Uh, so this is the baking network where you can see we have all the different bake passes that we need for the, for the process. And back here you can see we have the cooking process. Uh, we store out the SPS, oh, sorry, now I'm in the wrong graph, that didn't make sense. Sorry, so we render out the HDR maps from the ROCKS network. And finally, we're saving out the OBJ file and we're also generating a Maya file here in order to make it a little bit easier for me to show it to you uh, without having to assign a bunch of textures. So this uh, job editor is kind of a mess, but it allows me to run the job here. And what's going to happen now here, it's going to run a, another SCON script and uh, that was not what I wanted. Okay, let me, let me actually clear out the temporary files here. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, let's try again. So now things started happening here. And if we look in the task manager, you can see now we have five instances of instant meshes running here in parallel. And as these uh, finish, we will start switching to UVing. Let's see when that happens. Now we're in the UV Atlas tool here. And while all of this is running, I'm going to go to the uh, temporary directory uh, because I've actually used a trick here that I find very useful here. So in this build directory, you can see here are all the, the OBJ files that are being generated and here are all the baked maps. They're starting to come in now from the, from the batch processing here. Uh, but the important thing I want to talk about here is the fact that you see all these file names. They're all like these, like it, it's a hash basically. It's a kind of a random string of numbers and letters. And it's a very deliberate thing here. So all these file names are completely generated from what is in the process editor here, uh, where we, if we look at this one here, the file name of an output here is a hash of all the names of the input files and also all the parameters that are set on this, uh, this object. So it basically means that as long as you keep something uh, the same somewhere in this chain, the file names will be exactly the same. But if you make a change here, for instance, in the UV layout, anything downstream to that will have new file names. And the nice thing with a setup like this is that this cache or this temp directory, uh, when things are different, it won't overwrite each other. So it means it can grow really big, but it also means that it can keep many configurations. So if you're working on a game and uh, you get a new version of Perforce, all the, everything that was up to date from last time will be in this cache. And if you, for some reason, rebuild it and then you have to revert back to a previous version, all the old versions of the intermediate files will actually still be in the directory so you don't have to reprocess it. So it's a power that comes with like a little bit of responsibility because these directories can grow really big. But if you manage it, it can save people a lot of time uh, in rebuilding stuff that, that they have already had up to date in the past. Okay, so let's go back to Maya here now, and I want to make sure we're done running the, the process here. It should be done by now. It's all up to date. And now we can uh, go back to the um, uh, uh, go back to the output directory. 
And here we can see we have all the five rocks laid out here nicely. And if we bring them into Maya and we enable texturing, see we have textured rocks in Maya. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we have all five of them here. Uh, so we can bring them all in and show, look at them next to each other. And for a future demo, I will probably make a, another build stage where I actually assemble these guys in the same Maya file instead of having them as individual files here. Um, but the, the beauty of a system like this now is the ability to, to jump between configurations and try out different things or build all of them in parallel. So if we look at this and say, okay, you know what? I really like the one with the moss instead. We can go into this editor here and um, we edit uh, what we have for a rock type here. This is my preset. So in this case, uh, we had uh, one type that was called rock to uh, limestone to moss. And when we run jobs now, you will see here, if I open the, uh, the uh, task manager, you will see we go right to the SPS render stage here. And what's happening is that in the case of actually rendering out the textures, everything over here all the way to the baker was identical with last time. So that's all ca cached in the temporary directory, whereas the SPS render stage here has to be rerun. But uh, as you, you notice, this, uh, this uh, second run of it is much faster than the previous one. And I've also set it up to overwrite my old files. So in this case, I should be able to look at the results by just reloading all the textures here. So now we're back with the, with the uh, rocks with moss. And again, like just to hammer home the point with, the, with the, uh, having the hashes for the names, uh, we can go in here and switch back to the previous configuration. And uh, when we run jobs now, it will basically just copy a bunch of files because in this uh, temporary directory, uh, we actually have both configuration. Up here, you can see if you have the rocks with the moss, here are the ones with the previous configuration. So it was all up to date. So now when we update here, uh, we're back to the previous configuration. So by setting up your, uh, uh, by setting up these type of automatic processes, it allows you to texture massive amount of data. And again, like the important thing here is that this is not for every asset. It's, it's for the assets that you really don't want your artist to spend a lot of time on. That's where you, you want to use automation. So the final thing I want to show is more of a, uh, it's, it's not necessarily in the space of automation. It's a way where you can use the Substance Automation Toolkit in order to, so to say, expand the standard library of uh, uh, Substance Designer. And um, in this case, I'm going to look at uh, making a filter that is extremely painful to build manually, but very easy to build using a Python script. And uh, what it does is it's a median filter. And uh, what is a median filter? It's basically a filter where you take, uh, for each pixel, you find a neighborhood and you find the median value of all the pixels in a circle around it or in a square around it. And uh, building those manually would basically involve putting a texture sampler for each pixel that you want to fetch. And then you want to create the median for that by sorting all these values and picking out the median value. And uh, uh, if we go here to the median example, uh, in the output directory, I have my test median file here. And uh, first, let's look at what it actually does and what kind of artistic features it brings to the table. Uh, so here is a picture. This is the original one. Uh, here it is after I ran the median filter here. So you can ch change the radius and get this kind of uh, somewhat interesting blobby blur here. We also have a percentile setting to push. So rather than taking the median value, you take the lowest value within the filter kernel, or you take the highest value within the filter kernel. Um, so if you actually look how this one is implemented, um, 
We have, uh, a, uh, we have three different median filters, one with uh, the size uh, radius of three, one radius of seven, five, and one of seven. And then we have a stack here that blends between these images. So even though we have three discrete filters, we can get a continuous uh, uh, slider between them. And uh, opening the first one here, uh, where we are looking at just a few pixels, uh, this is what the pixel processor looks like. So this one you know, might be possible to do yourself, but if we instead go to something of the, uh, the more extreme here, where we look at seven pixels, uh, uh, we get something like this. So no sane human being would ever try to assemble one of these. And uh, basically with the automation toolkit, you can write a Python script that does that for you. And uh, the script, and again, like I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking Python code here, but uh, the script that we use for generate that one, yet generating that one looked like this. And uh, let's see, I'll open the right one here. So here is our bitonic sort function that I found on Wikipedia. <laughs> and interestingly, um, so what we have built is basically a set of Python data types that allows you to do math uh, like if you're programming in, uh, in an ordinary shading language, but instead of actually computing values, it will wire up these networks for you. So basically what we do here is we're looping over the filter kernel, we're creating a, a, a color or gray sampler between, depending on whether we're doing the monochrome version or the color uh, version of it. And then for all of those uh, samplers, we're doing the bitonic sort, and then we select an element here based on uh, the percentile setting. And this kind of actually looks like ordinary code, uh, but what will come out is actually something like this. Uh, and again, like I'm, uh, this can kind of explode into nodes that wouldn't be impossible to, to evaluate, but for a certain category of utility nodes, it's just the, the, uh, the best and the most feasible way of, of accomplishing these type of things. Cool. So that's the, the demos I'm going to show to you. So, uh, and, and the point I'm trying to make here again, like I wanna go back to the original point, and that is that these are just examples. This is a open-ended uh, product. Uh, it's low-level components. And uh, in order to get the most use of it, like think about what you have in terms of your texturing workflows and uh, whether there are like things that artists are doing they shouldn't really be doing, and then, you know, see if, it, uh, if it's something that makes sense for you to, to look at. Uh, also, the final thing I wanna say is that we have changed the pricing model. So we have quoted a different price in the past. The new price is uh, 5K per year uh, for a author license. So what we mean with that is that people that are actually developing scripts, it's a 5K per year license. But uh, with that license, you're also allowed to deploy it uh, to whatever scale you want inside of your studio. So, you know, if you can, if you can save an hour of artist time every day, it's a pretty good deal. Uh, so, that's it in terms of content. Anyone having any questions or thoughts? Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> No questions? Oh, come up to the mic and some, to make sure that everything is recorded. Hello. Uh, so obviously this is for texturing rocks, right? This one example. But can you quickly maybe just run off a couple ideas off the top of your head of other examples that you might be able to use something uh, like this automation process with? Yeah, I think such as uh, if you have like crates, if you want to get variation in crates, uh, table, chairs, those kind of things. Uh, another example that we have seen is like when people have like a multiplayer game where they have the same units for different teams, they want a slightly different uh, texture for each team, you want to stamp a logo on it, those kind of things. Uh, outside of the texturing process, do you see like a, a wide scale use as well uh, for something like this, some automation process? Um, so I don't whether whether it's just maybe uh, Using using your ba baking tools to like get get everything out for your entire game, or which obviously you kind of showed here as well. But whether it's for characters, uh, environment stuff, or with the last talk, 
with um, in, with substance, right? That was in this room. They were using some of the painting tools in Painter, like the um, um, the particle brushes and whatnot. Would you be able to automate like different things inside there as well as designer? Like, what do you see like in your mind the kind of broad use that might might be able to get out of something like this? Yeah. So there there are some interesting examples. One is, uh, for instance, in order to generate bakes that our baker can't do. Uh, I can see a lot of uh, opportunity to bring in a third party tool to do, th for instance, throw particles at, at objects and make sure that goes into your, your substance workflow. For instance, we have like a, a, a mask that is based on something more simulating rather than just, uh, just the ambient occlusion or those kind of things. Uh, another example we have seen are actually people doing like full scale hard asset, uh, hard surface assets where they're basically texturing them using a script. So the example we saw there was a robotic arm uh, made by Double Negative for the uh, Assassin's Creed movie uh, where they had like an object with four, uh, 250 or so uh, udim tiles and loading that one in Substance Designer or Painter was just not feasible so they basically had a person author a bunch of uh, substances and then using the bakers and the uh, uh, the render command, they could basically use the render form to, you know, batch out all the textures and when they wanted to do an update, they change one of the source material, run another script. So there are many ways you can uh, apply it, but I, I think uh, in, in the end exactly what the right place to put it depends a lot on, you know, what, what the bottlenecks are in your pipeline and what type of data you're working on. And uh, but yeah, in broad strokes, it, it, it can be very versatile, but it's also whenever you need to make changes downstream, if you have to go in and paint, then, then you're kind of in a dangerous situation because when you change something upstate, up, um, uh, upstream in, the, in your process, then you have to go in and repaint it. So you want to kind of have something that is automatic from the start to stop in order to avoid these like manual uh, tweaking or like because when you tweak, you're pretty much in a bad position if you have to change things up, uh, upstream. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, uh, great talk. Thank you. Uh, do you guys have support in, except for SPS Reflector, to export material properties or maybe like also the lighting information that's in this Material Designer? Is there a way to export that as like some sort of JSON dump? There's sort of like properties that you can export, but not the full kind of preview light set information. So I'm not, I'm not sure if I understood your question. Um, in Designer, the preview window that's used to like when, when the artist is making the materials, yeah. there's a bunch of kind of light settings, environment settings, things like that. Is there a way to extract that information using the SPS reflection thing that you mentioned? Yes. I mean, like you can pretty much look at all the data in the SPS file. So if it's okay. something that's carried, you know, if you save the SPS file and you can find it when you load it back up, it's something that okay. you can and get to. And that's exposed through the Python API. Yeah, through the Python API. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. I have one more question from my material artist. Uh, is, when is multi UV support set coming? Multi UVs? Yeah. Is that supported? Uh, so I don't think the bakers actually do multiple UVs. I might okay. be wrong on that. The one thing, I, I did a similar thing. In my case, it wasn't multi UV, it was before our bakers did UDIM. I basically set up a, a batch system where I basically used Maya to split up the file where only one UDIM tile, so I kind of duplicated the file. It was an ugly solution, yeah. but it was a workaround, and it should be very doable yeah. in this case, too. You basically put Maya in your process or whatever you prefer, and then you make whatever UV set you want to bake to as the initial one, and you save out all the UVs you want to bake for as individual files, and then you run them through the baker, and then you can send those to, to the substance pipeline. So it's certainly something you can integrate in a workflow like this. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, just a real quick question. Um, will the automation toolkit be involved or used in any way in the upcoming Substance Alchemy, or can you not say? Uh, well, I, it, it will do certain things like that, but no, I, I, it, it won't be like, it, it, it's, it's really for designer workflows that it, it is our most technical product and it's where it, where it fits in at the moment. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, Really quick question about the, um, so you know how you did the, the render for like the thumbnail using um, Arnold, Arnold, I said? Yeah. 
Um, how is that part of the pipeline in terms of integrating it with like an engine? If you wanted to do that render in your engine, does it depend on the engine's Python API plugins or? So, so in the end, in order to get it into a script like these, you, you either have to be able to find the feature as a Python script or as a command line tool. Mm -hmm. In the case of Arnold, it actually has a poorly documented but actually easy to kind of get and very useful API for Python. So in my case, the, the actual Python API calls are very straightforward. I'll see if I can, can show you a glance of what it, uh, what it actually does. But uh, uh, essentially, it's just calling a Python script where it, uh, uh, where it sets uh, the, the maps that I'm providing and then it generates a sphere for you and assigns it all. So the, this would be roughly what the, what the script looked like. So these are basically a bunch of Arnold API calls for like, you know, creating a bunch of assets and you know, setting a bunch of relationships between them. And finally, you end up here and does an AI render. And um, so, so yeah, it, it, it's certainly something that you can, uh, you can get into your, your pipeline. And you know, if you want to use a different uh, renderer, you, you better hope it has a Python API or a command line. And uh, I mean, like, that's the reason I'm not using IRA from inside of Substance Designer, because we can't drive it from, uh, from the command line. And uh, the, the, that's one of the, the, the things I like about the automation toolkit. It kind of allows you to pick tools from various places and like, put them together in, in one pipeline. So, Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. No more questions? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for listening.